areas of the United States lie in the convergence of dangerous weather patterns, and still others in regions of deadly seismic events. Though all agree that saving lives and property are the highest priority, can we ever adequately prepare for something as powerful as an earthquake? San Francisco shares with other Pacific Coast cities around the world one dubious distinction. It has more than once risen from the ash and rubble of a major earthquake, the most notorious in 1906, and is destined to do so again. It is not generally known that over the years, quakes have occurred in almost every region of the United States. Still no area is at greater risk than the Pacific Coast state of California. As for San Francisco, scientists had warned for years that another major quake was due. Then, in October 1989, the Earth slid, snagged and buckled at Loma Prieta along the infamous San Andreas Fault. San Francisco's worst collective nightmare had come true. Yet San Franciscans have had a long history of quakes along the San Andreas and related fault systems, going back earlier even than the Great Earthquake and Fire of 1906. From 1850 to 1900 alone, history documents that over 400 tremors hit the Bay Area. The danger increased dramatically as the city expanded to over 400,000 people by filling in wetlands. In 1868, surveyors reported that these new areas were unsafe. Heedless of the warnings, by 1906, nearly one-sixth of San Francisco's population lived on former wetlands. San Francisco at the turn of the century was a city of new splendor enjoying a unique balance between the western frontier spirit of the 19th century and the big city dreams of the 20th. A relic of that bygone era is this house belonging to a prominent San Francisco family since 1870. Built by businessman John Frederick Ortman, today it is home to Ortman's grandson, Dr. Albert Shoemate. San Francisco, at the time of the disaster of 06, was the, actual, the queen city of the Pacific Coast, not only in financial activities, but in uh, drama or any other of the arts. We were the main city, and one of the main occupations of the city was the uh, waterfront. It had been the major city on the Pacific Coast as far as the shipping from the various parts of the world. So the main city was San Francisco and had been, and had no feeling except that we'd always continue to be such. That, of course, changed with the disaster of 06 and came uh, to change very abruptly. At 5.12.05 in the morning, Wednesday, April 18, 1906, the clock on the ferry terminal at the foot of Market Street stopped its forward motion. For 75 agonizing seconds, the great city shook. For three solid days afterward, she would burn. The heat was so intense that all traces of physical evidence in its path were utterly obliterated. Gas mains, buildings, fire trucks, streetcars, people. Anything that could help investigators later to understand exactly what happened there was gone masking for future generations the true story behind the disaster. Richard Hansen, curator at the Museum of the City of San Francisco, maintains that the true scope of the disaster was deliberately downplayed after 1906 by government and business leaders. 1906 has many problems as far as scale and uh, magnitude of the disaster, in my opinion, because we've uncovered so many cover-ups the amount of damage that everybody's reporting to, they try to limit to only the Bay Area. We've been able to verify damage to within a few miles of LA, all the way up to the Oregon border, which is considerably larger area damage than in any of the early government reports. What was written were the first person accounts of some of the citizens, such as this one by Fred J. Hewitt, reporter for the San Francisco Examiner. To me, it seemed like an eternity. I was thrown on my back and the pavement pulsated like a living thing. 
Around me, the huge buildings wobbled and veered. Crash followed crash, resounding on all sides. Screeches rent the air as terrified humanity streamed out into the open in agony of despair. Frightened horses dashed headlong into ruins as they raced away in their abject fear. The forces that could cause such destruction are on a scale that defies the imagination. To monitor these forces and quakes as they happen in Northern California, the University of California at Berkeley employs an integrated system of 12 field stations linked to computers on campus. Professor Robert Erhammer explains the activity beneath the Earth's surface. The elastic rebound theory was formulated by H.F. Reed after looking at the effects of the 1906 earthquake and walking along the San Andreas Fault system and seeing how the fault was offset. The San Andreas Fault is merely the most well known. The entire state is riddled with these giant cracks in the Earth's plating, strangely shaping the landscape such as these hills to the north at Tamales Bay. Thrust faults like the one thought to lie below Los Angeles occur when one plate sliding on a sea of molten rock pushes by another on a diagonal. Strike slip faults like the San Andreas glide along each other laterally. Basically what's going on is that you have two tectonic plates, the Pacific plate to the southwest and the North American plate to the northeast. The San Andreas is the major plate boundary between the two plates. The Pacific plate is moving northwest relative to the North American plate at two inches a year. So this two inches a year is like distorting a big rubber sheet. Eventually you'll get so much strain energy accumulated that the crust can no longer sustain it. The fault will then rupture. When it ruptures, the two halves of the fault will fling back elastically to release this strain energy. That fling creates a strong ground shaking, which is the earthquake. How big the earthquake is depends on how big of a patch of the fault breaks. If the patch of the fault breaks is, say, a quarter mile square, you have maybe a magnitude 4 earthquake. If, say, 250 square miles of the fault breaks, like in Loma Prieta in 1989, then you have a magnitude 7. If it's a couple thousand square miles of fault that ruptures, and flings back elastically, you have a magnitude 8 earthquake. In the 1906 magnitude 8.2 quake, areas of the city built on former wetlands turned to trembling mud. Downtown and south of Market Street, brick buildings collapsed, trolley tracks zigzagged, and wooden structures began to burn. From the hundreds of gas lanterns and candles fallen to the floor and the wrecked gas mains in the streets, fires had started all over the city. The fire department's strength lay in its manpower, some 700 strong. Yet with a ruptured water supply and simultaneous calamities befalling the department, the task was nothing short of impossible. Thousands caught in collapsed buildings, destruction of firehouses and equipment, horses that had bolted from the fire stations, and finally a telephone and alarm system in a frayed tangle of wire. Those in the area heard the cries for help from the rooming house district where transients and day workers resided in wooden frame hotels over what had once been known as Pioche's Lake. The lake had more accurately been a depression caused by the great Hayward earthquake of 1868 and which had later been filled in in order to build cheap housing. The flimsy wooden structures, representing about a thousand rooms in total, fell in a domino-like fashion when the quake hit, collapsing on their sleeping inhabitants. The damage south of Market is um, very interesting because we've always been told that more people are going to die in brick buildings than in wood. That did not hold up. When we did the counts, more people died in wood frame than in brick. We have a couple of blocks that are just wood frame only. There's not a brick in the whole lot, except maybe a fireplace. And nobody got out. And we have a couple of blocks that, it's just like they cease to exist. A particularly horrible fate attended those staying at the wooden frame Valencia Hotel, which sank three stories into the former site of a stagnant swamp before collapsing upon itself. A main water conduit also sank into the mud, rupturing and flooding the entire area. Those that weren't crushed were drowned within the hotel as they struggled to free themselves from the tangled debris. The charismatic mayor of San Francisco, Eugene Schmitz, was a man more suited to the ballroom and backroom diplomacy of the city's heyday than to managing a disaster from a roving barrack-style city hall. But that's exactly what he had to do in the days and months that followed. 
Reports of mob violence and looting began to filter back to Mayor Schmitz, who saw the army as his only option for averting general chaos. He authorized the army to control law and order, handing the job over to Brigadier General Frederick Funston, the ranking officer at the Presidio Army Base. Mayor Schmitz went one big step further, personally authorizing the army and other armed forces to shoot all looters. The first ships that are coming into the bay, uh, military ships, the men are dressed for battle and told shoot to kill. We have one case in the Western Edition where a number of men are breaking into, for their local neighborhood, a local store, and a military unit arriving and taking them, and they just plain disappear. So you know what happened. They got shot. And the military, generally, from their records, seemed to, when they did shoot looters, they'd throw them into buildings that were on fire. General Funston had ordered 1,500 troops in the city by noon. With the police and fire departments in disarray, the army was the only truly organized force in the city. A triage point was established at the docks. Discrepancies in the official number of casualties occurred because the most seriously wounded were sent as far away as Chicago and Texas, a fact that would later aid city leaders in covering up the size of the disaster. It became apparent that a temporary hospital set up at the Mechanics Pavilion to treat the overflow of victims would soon be overtaken by fire. All available men, automobiles and carts were commandeered to aid in the enormous task of transporting patients out, leaving the crushed and burned bodies of the dead piled in the back of the pavilion to burn. The army began dynamiting buildings along Market Street hoping to create a fire break. They had wanted to dynamite further west, far enough away from the fire for the brakes to have a chance of working. But Mayor Schmitz ordered them stopped, as further west lay the homes and businesses of his political patrons. Later, they would be dynamited anyway, just in advance of the flames. As the next day dawned, the fate of San Francisco seemed to lie in the hands of the military dynamiting squad. Either the fire breaks they were creating further and further west would hold, or the soldiers would succeed in burning down the rest of the city with their explosives. There was the additional peril of homeowners deliberately setting fire to their homes so as to collect later on fire insurance. A few such homeowners caught in the act were shot. Still in a state of shock, people began to flee the city by all available means. In just 96 hours, an estimated 225,000 refugees would get out of the city. The greatest peacetime evacuation in U.S. history. The exodus would continue for months to come. The people seemed to be in shock and just watching. There seemed to be no panic. But uh, my father, my mother, and uh, I had an older brother. We left, and uh, my father drove the horses, and mother sitting in front carrying me and my brother, I don't know where he was, and we had a, uh, an African-American that uh, worked in the uh, stable, and uh, he sat in the back of the wagon and led a cow. We left and uh, went over to, uh, by boat to uh, Belvedere. My mother, I was always amused later on in life remembering some of the things she took. One was my father's silk hat and another was her wedding gown, neither of which I think would have been very practical, but what one might take in the, in the spur of the moment. Finally, winds shifted in the city's favor and blew the fire back to the areas which it had already ravaged. On the morning of the fourth day, the great San Francisco fire was finally hemmed in by a contingent of bleary-eyed but determined firefighters, where it ran out of fuel, sputtered a black cloud of smoke, and died. In the days that followed, it was very easy to lose one's way in the ruins of what had been the great city by the Golden Gate. Stripped of most of its familiar landmarks, it was now the burned-out shell of a city. Only a few large structures escaped both the devastation by earthquake and fire. All around lay ash and rubble. The fire had consumed four square miles of the city, including the downtown and business districts. 
Tent cities were erected in the city parks and vacant lots. Food and emergency supplies arrived from all over the country. In the initial weeks and months after the quake, soldiers pressed into service every man they could lay their hands on for digging graves and clearing the streets of rubble. Several months later, workers still had to wear heavy gloves to protect themselves from the heat of the bricks. The business community had a vested interest in the world's perception of San Francisco as a safe place to live and to invest. Incredibly, they managed to silence a large part of the 1906 earthquake, shifting the focus instead to the great fire of 06. Fires could happen anywhere, they explained, and thus San Franciscans had no more to fear than anyone else. One of the legacies of the 06 quake is the great number of substandard buildings erected in the years immediately following the disaster, when political and economic necessity dictated that the city be rebuilt quickly. By the time 1905 rolled around, you had a fairly decent building code compared to the rest of the country. Immediately after the earthquake, the politicians lowered the building codes by 50%, and it took up to 50 years for the code to get back to what it was in 1905. I think that's a tremendous curse, and again, the public does not realize that. Today's modern skyscrapers present a new set of challenges for architects like David Childs. We, we learn more and more every day, but there is a practical limit to what you can do. Do you design for the ultimate in every case? It wouldn't be possible. You wouldn't have windows in the building. It would be all steel structure to hold up. It's interesting, in one of our projects in San Francisco, um, uh, ways of suspending the building on ball bearings so the building will actually lift and move, lift out of the site and move uh, in, in relationship to its sidewalk, to perimeter, um, allowing buildings to flex and move. In order for tall buildings to move and sway during a quake and not fall down, they must be strong yet flexible, like a tree bending in the wind. The structural skeleton, durable yet able to give, holds the building together as a single unit. The January 1995 earthquake in Kobe, Japan claimed over 5,500 lives and caused an estimated $130 billion in damage. As with tall buildings, bridges need to be both elastic and strong. The Japanese approach to quake-proofing emphasized brute strength alone, which led to their failure. In the U.S., today's newer bridges have both flexibility and strength built in by having as one method internal steel wire wrapped around their concrete supports to keep them from shattering. Oakland's double-deck Nimitz freeway that collapsed during Loma Prieta lacked such quake proofing. As things evolve, we will know more and more how to withstand reasonable pressures, but in the ultimate case, there, there's no way you can make it actually earthquake proof. Just as we should not expect to out-engineer nature at its most violent, it is unwise to invest too much hope in earthquake prediction. Yet, advances in our understanding of how quakes behave may still save lives through appropriate zoning and building codes. We can forecast the odds of 1906 uh, type earthquakes occurring and other earthquakes occurring in Bay Area. And the best estimates we have is that a 1906 earthquake occurs on average probably every two to two and a half centuries, something of that order. There's no question that it will happen again. The question is when. The official toll from 1906 puts the number of dead at just over 400. Historians today have evidence of a much greater disaster with as many as 5,000 victims. Beyond the numbers, it is clear that saving lives, then as now, depends more on steps taken to minimize the hazards than on our ability to say when the next big one will strike, as it surely will. From space, the spiral arms of a hurricane have the natural beauty of a rare gem the swirling octopod structure of a far distant galaxy. Yet hurricanes often reveal another 
more sinister side, making it necessary to track their every move. Many are the voices who have warned of the dangers and who make it their job to protect us from their monstrous wrath. The winds were in excess of 200 miles an hour, tides over 24 feet above normal with at least a 10-foot sea on top of that. The church bells rang wildly in the raging winds until they tumbled from their towers and were churned into the raging sea. The Gulf Coast of Mississippi, graced by Spanish moss, live oak, and antebellum mansions, is known as the Riviera of the Gulf. Offering water sports and shimmering beaches by day, live entertainment and modern casinos by night. Also indigenous to this area is the taste of shrimp, its shrimping fleet being one of the largest in the world. All this bounty comes at a price though which is eked out each year during hurricane season. Yet no storm can top Killer Camille of August 1969, the most powerful storm to hit anywhere ever in the United States. Director of Civil Defense on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, Wade Geist points out the high water marks of a few lesser though potent storms and of Camille at the very top. Our record storm in 1947 before Camille devastated the area. In comparison in 1969, Hurricane Camille was a catastrophic hurricane. The approach of a hurricane initiates a chain of communications between different levels of government to assess the danger. In this case, Camille was an especially difficult storm to predict. In the Civil Defense Emergency Operations Center, we went into an increased readiness posture two days before the storm actually came ashore. And this is what every community on the seacoast does, those that take their business seriously. Anytime a storm gets into the Gulf of Mexico, somebody's going to be hit. At the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Director Robert Burpee describes the steps taken back in 1969 to monitor Camille's progress. In 69, we had reconnaissance aircraft to track the storms. We had satellites in place and near land. We had radar systems to track Camille. The strength of the storm just wasn't well known, but it was known that Camille uh, was rapidly deepening and was a very intense storm. Saturday, the day before the hurricane hit, uh, they were looking at a massive hurricane. Filled up the entire Gulf of Mexico. Sunday morning, it had shrunk up into a tiny little thing and there were two trains of thought. One train of thought was, look, uh, it, 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 it's lessening in strength. And the other thought was, no, she's winding up. Hurricanes are one of the most ferocious and unpredictable of Earth's storms because the elements that create them are themselves so large and erratic. Hurricanes begin in the tropics with a low pressure system in which the central core is warmer than the surrounding atmosphere. This warmer air laden with moisture rises and condenses, heating up air masses at higher levels which in turn rise still further. Strong winds rush in to fill the void left by the masses of warm rising air. The strong winds bring with them bands of instability, which are actually strings of thunderstorms spiraling about the newly formed hurricane's eye. The computer guidance models at the time of Camille tended to take the storm more to the northeast rather than to the north-northwest, which was its actual track. That Sunday morning, uh, we had been monitoring the storm all through uh, the night and received uh, uh, our information that, hey, at 5 o'clock that morning that the storm in, indeed is going to hit head-on into Harrison County, Mississippi. In 1969, by issuing a warning to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, Dr. Robert H. Simpson, then director of the National Hurricane Center, correctly chose to follow his instincts and ignored the computer models. By this time, Air Force reconnaissance jets were recording winds of 220 miles per hour at the storm center. 
Deadly hurricanes have been documented along the coast from the first Spanish conquistadors to the present, the area being a natural point of landfall for storms in the Gulf of Mexico. An early measure to protect the coast was taken back in 1927 when the Army Corps of Engineers built this seawall. Along this stretch of coast, Costavlahos' family had settled after immigrating from Greece and became successful enough in the restaurant business to build a house on the shore road. Vlahos' family rebuilt their home a little further back after Camille. At the foot of the gray sidewalk is where you made the first step into the house. We've pushed the house back a little bit more now. However, along the coast, there are the countless steps to nowhere of those that were never rebuilt at all. I got a call from a gentleman who owned a, a gift shop across the street from my dad's restaurant. And he said that the latest information was that it was coming and that was gonna, it was going to hit sometime late that evening. And all of us who live on the coast understand that when a hurricane hits at night, it's more damaging than those hurricanes which hit in the daytime. Well, we had the players in place and we put the loud speaking systems out into the field and uh, law enforcement and public works and fire service and everybody we could knocking on doors, moving people. It was a fairly orderly evacuation uh, because we were expecting a 15 foot tide then, 150 mile an hour wind, which is a very serious storm. And three o'clock that afternoon, we heard that the storm is winding up. Instead of 150 mile an hour winds, we're looking at 200 miles an hour. We needed to leave from this area. And, you know, we had told our parents that we ought to leave. And their big block, mental block, was that the 47 hurricane had not destroyed this house. And nothing could be worse than the 47 hurricane. We had been through hurricanes before. Uh, recently, the storm of Hurricane Betsy in 65, where we had three feet of water. So I guess you felt we were the veterans of hurricanes, we were prepared, uh, we knew what to expect. Ironically, one's past experience with storms can be the greatest stumbling block. For this reason, Daniel Geis, who was then mayor of Biloxi, spent half the night at the local television station until it was destroyed, trying to persuade people that this hurricane was going to be worse than past ones. I was at the WLX-TV, and, and we worked until the station was inundated trying to get people to leave their homes and get out of town because we could see what a dangerous type of storm this was likely going to be. It didn't look that way at first, but it, it came in with strength that we'd never seen before and didn't know how to respond, really. It's now 6.30 p.m. Sunday in Biloxi, Mississippi, and the hurricane is really beginning to be felt here. Katie Kovacevich, a first-generation American from Eastern Europe and a fisherman's wife, thought she had seen everything until Camille. I guess we must have heard something that was coming, but we never paid no mind to it. That we, had, we went through so many of them already, we didn't think it was going to be that bad. By 8 p.m., power lines are falling, starting fires, and winds are whipping them out of control, and the element of darkness adds to the danger. I knew it was my last shot at getting Uncle Jimmy and Aunt Angeline out of there, and I looked out. We had no lights, but I had a, a pretty good-sized beam, and the water was at the foot of her steps. It was lapping. The waves were lapping at that point in time, so I called Aunt Angeline out there, and I, I visited with her, and tried to come up with some words that would convince her to move that we had nothing to lose by going up to the cottages, which would take us probably about 10 more feet above what the floor level of the house on the beach was. I remember distinctly in Greek, I told her, uh, and I tried to reach her soul, and I told her simply that, and Angeline, just as stubborn as you and Uncle Jimmy are to stay here at this house, I'm equally as stubborn to stay here to see if I can save your lives. And I want you to know that if you're wrong, and we die, my death will be on your soul. It's 10 o'clock in Biloxi now, and the eye of the storm, they say, is still over two hours away. The wind is so strong, one can hardly stand up in it. The rain is torrential, streets are flooded, we are cut off from the outside world in our motel here. There is no power, everything is black. 
Around 10 o'clock that night, uh, the first wave of water came in about three feet, and we were prepared. We had everything up four and a half, five feet above the uh, floor, and we were in good shape until about an hour later when the second wave came in. And that's when we were in deep trouble. We was all sitting by the kitchen table. And I said to Frank, I said, Frank, the floor furnace came up. That's where the water came through. Up to my knees in, in, in a second. And I said to Frank, I said, Frank, we're moving. Uh, he, and he said in Salonia, all oh, Luda, it means, are oh, you crazy? You know, I said, no, I ain't crazy. Hurricane Camille certainly had the strongest storm surge uh, that's been seen this century. When Camille's eye passed over Harrison County, Mississippi late that night, it brought with it a world record surge of water along the coast. A storm surge forms below the hurricane's eye when it heads for the coast. Gales drive seas toward the low pressure center and the mound of water builds as it is pushed upward by the shallower ocean floor. Estimates are that the maximum surge along the coast of Mississippi was an uh, order of 25 feet above the mean tide. We had to swim about 12 to 15 feet against the surge of the water to the windows on the front porch of the house and climb up the fireplace and get behind the fireplace on the flat roof. Then in, in, in my bedroom, all, all, it, it took all the curtains it took everything but the Venetian blinds, the shades and everything off the windows. And all the beds got all wet, soaking wet. And in the other room, my big chiffon rope went down. Got all, everything was in there, all the clothes got grounded out. <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing right now, but I didn't laugh then. The house started to rock up and down, and we had to make a decision whether to stay with the chimney or go with the house. And why, I cannot tell you, but we decided to go with the house. We floated 82 feet to the back of the yard and lodged in a pine tree. That's where we spent the next five, six hours hanging on to one another, laying face down in the water, uh, being pelted with everything that you can think of, uh, debris from other houses, uh, tree limbs, the wind, the rain. And if there was any lines of communications between Henderson Point and God in heaven, I had one of them tied up. Because all you could do is pray. aftermath of Hurricane Camille was almost beyond description. You would have to have seen it with your own eyes. You would have to have smelled the stench of death with your own nose. You would have to have heard the cries of despair with your own ears. <laughs> the next morning after it was over with and the water went down, so did the house. And as the house went down, it scraped the pine tree. And from the, where the house was lodged to the ground, the Corps of Engineers was able to determine that there was 24 feet 6 inches of water at our location. If you just saw what I had in my yard, I had two speedboats in my yard, great big ones. All kind of awnings, all kind of poles. What I never had, I don't know, in my yard. We went up the overpass at Henderson Point and looked around. It was dead quiet, and it looked like the pictures that we saw in the history books of uh, the cities over in Europe after World War II where they were bombed out. There was just destruction everywhere uh, and nobody moving. Mixon's hometown past Christian was the worst hit. When the storm was over, more than 100 bodies would be found sprawled in the mud and debris, including an entire family of 13. The destruction along the coast is near total. In Biloxi, Costavlahos returns with his family to his boyhood home to see what's left. The rubble from my house and every house that was along the beach seemed to have settled in my neighbor's house to the north. We walked down here, and as we walked down here, I knew that the top half of our house was gone. That's all I could see from above the rubble. And that meant everything that Papa and Mama had brought over from Greece 
whatever pictures they had of their family, whatever little mementos they brought with them from Greece on the trip through Ellis Island, through New York, down to Biloxi, were destroyed as well. The sick and injured are airlifted out. The bodies of those who could not or would not heed the warnings will be uncovered for days and weeks to come. How many bodies have you found so far? This makes 19 for us. A coroner's report last night about 8 o'clock was 88 confirmed in Harrison County. With no food, water, or electricity, the survivors are still not out of danger, and supplies are urgently shipped in. Meanwhile, Camille rages inland, turning east through the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia and West Virginia. One hundred fourteen would die in the Virginias where the storm beginning to dissipate would let loose its moisture in torrential floods when it met the cooler air of the mountains. It just came down through this area, just like an ocean wave, more or less. And these people right in here, they just didn't have a chance. They just took every, all these houses through here. There are total count of 23 gone. Back along the coast, Camille would affect over 75,000 families in all, claiming 145 lives, destroying over 5,500 homes and damaging tens of thousands more. For the first few days, it was just a matter of survival. And it was a good thing to run all up and down the Gulf Coast and see little tattered flags flying there, uh, reminding people that we still believed. And there was something about it that seemed to, to help. Everybody knew that uh, Camille was an extremely intense storm. Uh, the specific wind speeds were were not well known, and that led to improvements in the instrumentation on the reconnaissance aircraft. Also, I think uh, Camille was one of several factors leading to the improvement in, in the capability of the radars. Yet any improvements in forecasting on the national level are meaningless without thorough coordination, and especially community cooperation with authorities on the local level. In that great storm, we did not have the authority to order and enforce evacuation. Uh, the legislature shortly after Hurricane Camille gave us that authority. We will not hesitate and have not hesitated to order evacuation. The only thing that I could take and tell people from my hurricane experience the night of Camille is if someone tells you to get out because a hurricane is coming, don't second guess them. Don't think that you've been through it and you can handle it and it's not going to happen to you. It's just a matter of time before it happens. So to put it bluntly, if someone tells you civil defense uh, people or whoever say evacuate, get the hell out. Hurricanes have long shown themselves to be cyclical in nature. Vulnerable areas such as the proud old Gulf Coast are overdue for increased activity. This coupled with an explosion of new development in coastal areas translates into a destruction potential such as we haven't seen, not since Killer Camille, the greatest storm of any kind that has ever affected this nation. Stately they stand the mountains of the Cascade Range. They are icons of the regions and towns over which they tower. As the Pacific Northwest grew into the high-tech towns of today, from a cluster of logging and fur outposts, the mountains remained unchanged. Until 1980, when Mount St. Helens calved whole blocks of its perfect cone-shaped summit in a mighty explosion. The two-month-long eruption of Mount St. Helens was the largest and most documented volcanic disaster in the history of the United States. 
Scientists who had been studying the volcano prior to 1980 suspected the dangerous forces lurking beneath the perfectly shaped summit. Mount St. Helens was the beautiful poster child of the Cascades, renowned for the serenity of its clear lakes, rivers, and backwoods. But on May 18, 1980, the mountain proved the scientist right. The whole summit of the volcano, which was 2,000 feet higher than the present rim of the volcano, and all the rock that, that filled what is now the crater of the volcano slid from the volcano down into this valley below us. It sent a thick uh, mass of debris northward from the volcano, crossing the Tula River Valley and sloshing up this ridge that we're standing on, and also uh, that, that flow of volcanic debris extended about 17 miles down the Tootle River Valley. As soon as that uh, material started to slide away from the crest of the volcano, it reduced the pressure on a body of molten rock or magma that had accumulated inside the volcano, generating a gigantic explosion that sent a laterally directed cloud of rock debris across the country, spreading out in a, in a 180 degree arc uh, out about 17 or 18 miles from the volcano, mowing down all the trees and causing uh, most of the deaths that occurred uh, during that eruption. The full picture of what is happening inland along the Cascade Range starts at the Pacific Coast, where oceanic plates plunge deep beneath the Earth's surface where they meet the continent. The same mechanism, the plate tectonic motions, that generate earthquakes also generate the volcanoes. At UC Berkeley, Professor Robert Urhammer explains the Earth's mechanics underlying the volcanoes of the Cascade Range. If you look around the Pacific Rim, which is also known by another name, the Ring of Fire, if you look at each segment, like all along the island arcs in the western Pacific, and then also along the northwestern part of North America, and you look at the Cascade volcano chains, one thing you'll find out that's common to all of these are that you'll have a subducting plate. That is, in each case, instead of having horizontal motions like occurred in 1906 along the San Andreas where everything moves to the right when you look across it, what happens here is the plates are merging together and the Pacific plate is subducting under North America. As it subducts down, where it gets to a depth of about 100 miles, you generate heat and you generate magma, which then will come to the surface and generate your volcanoes. And so it's the same mechanism as creating the earthquake is also uh, creating the uh, volcanoes around the Ring of Fire. People usually associate molten lava with volcanic events, such as the eruptions of Mauna Loa and Kilauea in Hawaii. However, the blast at Mount St. Helens was characterized by a frothy kind of lava known as pumice, indicating a more powerfully explosive kind of eruption. Long before the eruption, scientists knew that the Ring of Fire, the Pacific Rim's active band of volcanoes, included Mount St. Helens. They cited evidence consisting of rock samples which established Mount St. Helens as the youngest major volcano of the Cascade Range. Young volcanoes are known to be generally more active than older ones. These findings were borne out by other factors plain to the naked eye. Ropey lava flows still visible today on the volcano's southern flank testified to a relatively recent violent past and the mountain's own symmetrical shape, too new to have been scarred by weather, glaciers, and time. When quakes and ash-filled steam began to mar that pretty face in March 1980, volcano experts from the USGS sprung into action, knowing that this was the beginning of something very big. In order for a, a volcano to erupt new molten rock material, that rock material, or magma, has to work its way up to the surface. In order to do that, it has to break a passage through the rocks, and it, it, it cracks the rocks as it rises, and every little rock cracking event 
causes an earthquake, is expressed as an earthquake. And so we use seismometers to monitor the volcanoes and detect the swarms of earthquakes that we've learned are signals of an impending eruption. On May 18th at 8.32 in the morning, a final cataclysmic quake caused the entire north flank of the mountain to collapse in the largest landslide debris avalanche ever recorded in history. Huge sections slid down the mountain, traveling at speeds of 155 to 180 miles an hour. The collapse of Mount St. Helens unleashed an explosion of pent-up gases, rock and ash so great that it devastated in seconds everything in a 230 square mile sector northwest of the mountain. The blast was estimated to have been 2,500 times as powerful as the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. Meanwhile, a flow of steaming debris, the consistency of cement, was making its way down the drainage basins of Mount St. Helens toward the forest lands and towns to the west. The blast was followed by the beginning of nine hours of a big pumice-producing eruption column. Uh, the column extended about uh, up to about 65,000 feet or so in the atmosphere, and atmospheric winds quickly carried the ash uh, of that eruption column uh, eastward um, all the way to Montana. The column of ash and steam rose to an altitude of more than 12 miles. The densest part of the ash drifted northeast, blanketing the land and people downwind. The blast and debris flow would claim 62 lives, most of them homeowners, campers, and loggers who had not gotten out of the devastation zone in time. I would made up my mind I was going to make it, but the wife and my friend wanted to give up and I couldn't turn it. Just, I don't know, it's hard for me to even realize what has happened. Rescuers managed to save a hundred people from this hell on earth. There were some pack, some people packed in up here uh, from on Ryan Lake, and their two pack horses are dead, and their their vehicles are there and everything. But I think they must have got them out. Although there is a dead man there. There's a a dead man, yeah. Also situated on the ring of fire, Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia erupted in 1985, killing more than 25,000 people. However, the massive eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines just six years later was far less deadly thanks to a coordinated effort of scientists worldwide to warn of the dangers. The eruption of Pinatubo was preceded by a vigorous uh, series of steam explosions that attracted attention to the volcano, and the, our, our Philippine counterparts uh, established a seismic network and discovered that there was a continuing swarm of earthquakes uh, going on. The USGS Volcano uh, Crisis Assistance Team was asked to assist and our ability to assess the hazards and to evaluate the progress of the volcano toward eruption were key in evacuating Clark Air Base and Philippine communities on the flanks of the volcanoes and I'm sure saved many, many lives. It is difficult to comprehend how in the space of a few hours a verdant wilderness could be transformed into a desert wasteland. But there was once a people who lived on this land who had a deeper understanding and healthy respect for its power. The Indians that lived around Mount St. Helens had a rich mythology uh, that talked about the landscape, that explained how landforms came to be here, explained how they were created, explained the relationship of the landforms to the people. And the volcanoes play a real important uh, role in the mythology. The stories talk about how the mountains threw fire back and forth at each other, uh, how La Hue La Tla, La Hue La Tla was the local name for Mount St. Helens. It means smoker. But the myths talk about how 
La Way La Pla through fire at uh, Mount Adams uh, in one version, Mount Hood in another version. And so you can see the understanding of the power of these volcanoes in the mythology. There is a consensus among scientists and disaster management planners that the real threat in the Cascades lies to the north of Mount St. Helens with its bigger sibling, Mount Rainier. In the shadow of Rainier, William Loki is in charge of hazard management for Pierce County, Washington, including the city of Tacoma. Well, um, Mount Rainier seems so solid and uh, it, um, you know, so stately uh, as part of our skyline, yet from the uh, Mount St. Helens eruption, um, we've learned that there's a tremendous amount of potential energy that is there. Some of the work be that's been done at Mount Rainier suggests that uh, there have been uh, roughly uh, 60 at least big mud flows uh, generated from Mount Rainier within the, during the last 10,000 years. Some of those may have been related to volcanic eruptions, but many of them were not. And they're just uh, simply fail failures uh, of the volcano flank as a consequence of progressive alteration of the rocks, turning them into gooey clay. Uh, this is the kind of threat that is very difficult for hazard managers because although it poses what could be a very significant threat to the population in the lowlands around the mountain, it's the kind of event that occurs on thousands of year intervals. So it's, uh, it's not as easy to deal with as our periodic flooding or our even less periodic earthquakes. Uh, the Mount St. Helens uh, researchers told us had about 4.5 billion cubic feet of snow and ice on it available to turn into mud and we're all familiar with the damage uh, that was caused by the mud flows that came down the Tootle Valley uh, and off Mount uh, St. Helens. On Mount Rainier they estimate 156 billion cubic feet of snow and ice, a tremendous amount more. As a matter of fact above 12,000 feet on Mount Rainier is twice the snow and ice that was on Mount St. Helens. So a tremendous amount of potential energy there um, should the mountain by volcanic activity uh, start to heat up or even by non-volcanic uh, events such as earthquakes or just a sector collapse of the mountain under its own weight. I think the native people that lived around Mount St. Helens had a healthy respect for the volcano, as, as did other people that lived around other volcanoes in the Cascade Range. I think they had an understanding of the power of the volcano. They, they lived through, at the time people were here, for the uh, eight to 10,000 year span that people occupied the Cascade Mountains, they saw many eruptions of, of several volcanoes. So they learned to understand what power and force these mountains had and how these mountains were different from the other mountains in the Cascade Range. They, uh, they learned perhaps that the mountains were capable of sending large amounts of debris downstream. Uh, since they lived along these tributaries that drained the volcanoes, they probably knew to move their camps, their villages, their settlements to the higher ground, the safer ground. They had a common sense in their land use that perhaps we as newcomers, as relative newcomers to these mountains, need, need to learn from them. And I think many of us clustered in our, our cities and our towns on the lower reaches of these rivers uh, have, have yet to learn that kind of an intimacy. In this century, steady progress has been made in understanding the great forces of the planet. Someday, predicting huge events such as volcanic eruptions may actually be feasible, though others, such as earthquakes, probably never will. Still, the best option for saving lives and property remains getting them out of harm's way, the key being effective zoning and land use. The windfall could be the preservation of some wild habitat, which is certainly a kinder use of the natural world. A world that the native peoples have always believed should be treated with solemn respect or else risk its powerful wrath. <laughs>